Bless you. Please turn around. Just acknowledge each other in the house. Just wave, look around. Amen. Thank you, Chao Yi, for your wonderful words. Just acknowledge everyone around. Praise God. Thank you for that inspiring word, message that you shared. And I know God has a plan. It's a part of a journey, We're going from glory to glory. So we stand all together united. The Bible says there's no Jew, there's no Greek, no male, no female, no bond, no free. So there's no, God is not a God of different nations. He's a God of the world. And we thank God that you're a part of this move now, in China, especially in China, Beijing and different parts, different cities. We know a lot of things are happening. So praise God. So God bless you. It's amazing. Are you blessed to be here? Yes. We had some great worship, praise. I want to welcome as well my dear beloved friend, Leo Thorncroft. Amen. Well, let's give an apostolic welcome to him. He's a prevention officer for Enfield. Uh, so he's, uh, he's, can we have a good connection there. He's been to many of some of our events and we put him through a, gr a grilling a fitness regime this Wednesday. We trained together for 12 rounds and he survived it, praise God. So we're, we're doing well. Amen. <laughs> the fact that he's here means that he's over, you know, he's he become stronger. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So we're, <laughs> we're, we're stronger. So praise God. We're on a journey. Praise the Lord. Amen. We have, we have a few items today. So we go, as we go through, we'll just unfold them and share them with you. Praise God. But just feel comfortable, but not too comfortable. I'll make you uncomfortable to, for the Holy Spirit to comfort you. So I, want to have a, I have a message for you today. The theme for today's message is, there is an end to it. There is an end to it. In the, the church fathers said that whatever has a beginning has an end. It could be good, bad, indifferent, but always life is changing, moving forward. And we, we, we overcome. Nothing remains the same. We're going, we're like an organism, we grow, we develop all the time. So the theme for today is there is an end to it. While we prepare to reflect on this message, I've asked Pastor Julian to give the scriptural readings to some individuals in the church. I, 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 I let, him, let him make the choice. So who's doing the readings? I got no idea. Who's doing the readings? Pastor, yes, do you want to come up? Two, yeah, there we are. Come up. I made that kind of custom on Sunday to ask yourselves to be a part of the message. So come. So who's got the Old Testament? Yeah, you go first. And then we have the New Testament. God bless you. Welcome. Praise the Lord. You okay? God bless you. There you go. Um, for thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will, sorry, and I will bring you back from your captivity. And I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you to the place from which I caused you to be carried away captive. Thank you very much. Jeremiah 29, verse 10 and verse 14. And you are reading, which verse are you reading for us? John chapter 19, verse 28 and verse 13. <clears throat> After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Thank you. God bless you. You're very brave. You're, very, you're both very brave. God bless you. Did you know how you frighten people standing here? Thank you. God bless you. Amen. Lovely. The two readings. One is Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 10 to verse 14, and John chapter 19, verse 28 to verse 30. But I like what it says here in Jeremiah as it begins here. It says, um, the Lord knows what he has for our plans for us. He says in verse 11, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. So if you feel hopeless and helpless today, there is hope 
and there is help, praise God. And help comes from the Lord. Amen, praise God. And then we've read the Gospel of John where they read wonderfully the Gospel of John chapter 19. And the, 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 the verse I want to draw out from here is where Jesus says the word, it is finished. There is an end. There is an end to it. All the suffering, all the opposition, all the persecution, all the affliction that the master went through, he said on the cross, it is finished. And that's a full stop. Means, implies a new beginning. When you go to the cinema and you're watching a film, at the end comes up big letters, it says, the end. How many of you stay in the theatre and continue to look at the blank screen? You get up and you leave. That's your prompt, that's your cue, it's over. And today you're going to project out to whatever's going on in your life, the end. And you're leaving here, transformed, new beginnings, new opportunities with new things and a new horizon for you. And that's what the Word of God promises us. That's what God says. He knows. He plans for us. We need to connect to his plan. Praise God. I've actually asked for some milk to be brought here. Sorry. I know some people are on solids, but let's come to the milk for the, for the moment. You know, you, you, sometimes you do things. We, we go to our supermarket stores and so on. We get things. We don't really think about what, we're, what really is happening around. But when you're going to the supermarket, you, you do this without even thinking about it. Yeah, you don't even think about it. You don't even pay notice to this. But when you go to the you know, local grocery store, you take an item. What's the first thing you look on it if you do that? You take, or maybe you assume that's in date. But one thing is everything has expiry date. So you look on it and you say, when is the expiry date? You don't buy things that's a week out of date, do you? Yeah? So you look at the dates and everything has an expiry date. There's an end to things in life. That's a mindset we have. So we're, we're created, and I leave the milk there. So I hope, I pray you go into solids today from milk into solids. But there is an end to it. And the, and the word of God declares that, proclaims that. Jesus on the cross said, It is finished. The Greek word, the last day, it is finished. Everything has been fulfilled. And I'd like to say that our life has gone for a cycle, and whatever we are today, whatever challenges we've had previously, even to come in here today, they could be erased, eradicated, and you can leave here with a blank script, blank page to have a new beginning. I pray that that will be your portion for today. But I just want to lay a few things, foundations, uh, before I expound on this word. It is finished and it's over and there is an end to it. I want to just show you something about the, the, the makeup of the word of God. Everyone reads the Bible. Many people all over the world read the Bible, but there's a way to read the Bible. You need to read the Bible through the lens of the Holy Spirit. It comes from prayer, because otherwise knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And you need to know how to apply the scripture in different areas of our lives. We don't just use scripture in a cliche manner, just quote scripture for the sake of it. In the same way, you don't go to the doctor, and the doctor gives you a prescription, the same prescription to every patient, there's a prescription for every type of ailment. You don't just go to the doctor and he gives you aspirins for everything you have. If you've broken your leg, he gives you an aspirin. Yeah, it might help the pain, but it, you need to do something more, more than just take the aspirin. But what I'm saying is that the Word of God works in that kind of way. It meets us in the different places of our life, but we need to be wise to know how to apply it into our lives. And I want to show you a few scriptures that qualify this before I move on to the message, because otherwise I'm just speaking at you and not with you. And I want to speak with you that we, it's, it's an interaction, it's a two-way street. Even though you're sitting there listening, you are participating when you start to understand the mechanism of how the Word of God works. I wish I'm speaking to someone. Okay? I'll try and be slow because I know, I know there's been some translation being done in Chinese and whatever, but I'll try and be... I won't, I won't run ahead. The Apostle Paul tells us, told the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, that it says, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit. And this is for the people watching live stream as well. Uh, things of the Spirit. For they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. What the, 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 the challenge we have, humanity has, is we, put, we, we compare and contrast we put religion up against relationship. We put rules up against relationship. So oftentimes, being religious is just following some rules, okay, and learning about God, but never knowing him personally. But God wants to transcend that. He wants a relationship, not just to follow just the rules. 
He wants to connect with us, okay? And so the Apostle Paul says that the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness in, in, in a sense that the natural man, carnality is our limitations, cannot receive the things of God. So we have to change, look for a different filter, have a different outlook to start understanding the things of God. And that comes through prayer and desiring in the heart to understand what God wants to say to us. It's, it's participation. It's co-workmanship. It's not, just, it's not just academia, learning knowledge and information. It's about reconnecting, saying, Lord, I know there is a creator. I want to connect with my creator on a personal basis. And this is what Jesus came to bring about, that personal relationship between him and us, how he intended at the moment, at the beginning. Amen? So there is an end to our our, our, our preconceptions, and we have to have a new outlook, a new mindset, a new, a new, a fresh a, a, a beginning. And it's very, very important. And so as we read through the, the Word of God, we, re, we discover that even the apostles, when they followed Jesus, they didn't understand everything about Jesus. They didn't understand the mission. They didn't understand his purpose. And they needed divine assistance to understand the things of God. Yeah. So if you, have, if you have any notes, you can listen to the message later on in the archives. But I want you to think about what I'm sharing with you because we want, to come into, we want to come within and not just look from outside. It's one thing looking at a building from outside. God wants you to enter the building to see what's inside the building, the treasures, the richness, what's the design from within inside. You can guess, you can make assumptions from outside, but God wants you to enter you know, enter the kingdom of God. I went to his gates with praise given in my heart. Yeah? So we need to enter that. And how we come to that? We, we allow him to permeate us. Praise God. Hallelujah. So, so, uh, so, so we want to have a rich understanding. And also, we need divine assistance to get there. And even the disciples who, who were with Jesus three years, and we can be forgiven and excused the fact that we don't always understand everything. We need him to open our minds and our understanding. Even the disciples were with Jesus for three years. They walked with him. They talked with him. They saw the miracles. They ate with him. They saw him walking on water. They saw him raise the dead. And they still couldn't understand the divine economy, the divine purpose. And Jesus had to help them, assist them to start understanding his mission. Because the natural man does not understand the things of the... I wish I'm speaking to someone today. And so what happened after even he had resurrected? They were, they were experiencing the... They saw him physically resurrect. They still didn't understand their purpose, their plan, and, the, and their role in this tr transformation in humanity. Because everything changed from the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The world has never been the same again. There was a change. The calendar changed. The way people looked at life changed. There was transformation. So when you experience the resurrection, you cannot be the same again. Amen. Changes everything about you. Because you're restoring that likeness of God, that characteristics of God, the images and likeness of God. And what's God's attributes? What's God's characteristics? It's love, mercy, compassion, forgiveness, servitude. Jesus said, I've come to serve, not to be served. It's not about just taking. When you come step over into the divine realm, you, you start learning how to give, not only to take. The natural man only knows how to take, use, and abuse. The spiritual man knows how to give, in spite and not because we give, not because what we get out of it, because it's part of our nature. A dog barks because it's a dog. A cat meows because it's a, it's a cat. A bird sings because it does it because it's, it's, it doesn't have to think about it. That's what it is by nature. And when you step over to the divine realm, you begin to be merciful, loving, compassion that no, forgiving and giving and serving it becomes your natural disposition this is what it's about but even the disciples didn't understand it they could be excused because they needed the divine intervention and that's what we need in church we need the divine injection to transform us it's not about religion rites and rites and ceremonies it's about a way of life now watch this Jesus resurrected from the dead they encountered him at the resurrection, and they were, they were bewildered. But this is what happens. I want to just qualify this because I want you to, because I want to share a message about there is an end to it. But if you don't understand the mechanisms of God, you will understand that God has already intervened and dealt with your situation. God has already dealt with your situation before you've asked him to deal with your situation. All you need to walk into that newness, what God is doing, but you need the revelation to know there's a newness there for you to walk in that newness. 
Hallelujah. Because, as someone once said, the Word of God is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. And we need to know how to unpack and decode the mysteries of God. And we don't do it. God does it for us. And so at the resurrection, watch this. In, in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, this is what happens here. They thought it was all over. And it was, and it was all over because it had been finished. She said, it's finished, it's all over. But something new is about to begin. There's been the full stop. Now it's a new chapter. Now it's a new sentence and a new beginning. What are you allowing God to, to include in your new beginning? It's a consensual thing. God does not force himself on you or, or, or take you by ransom. He, he wants you to invite him, to accept him and receive him and follow him. And so this is what, what we're told in Luke 24, verse 44. Then he said to them, these words are the words which, which I spoke to you, to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. So he's, going, he's referring them back to the Old Testament because we, embodied in the Old Testament is his mission because the New Testament is embodied in the Old and revealed in the New, Yeah. Christ is embodied in the old, but revealed in the new. And then verse 45, watch this. And he opened their understanding that they, may, they might comprehend the scriptures. Amen. Now that's a powerful sense statement there. Uh, verse, a powerful verse. They didn't open their understanding. He says, and he opened their understanding. Yeah? Okay. So the implication is, if he did not open their understanding, their minds will still be locked in their ignorance. So our prayer must be, Lord, open my understanding. Because without you, I can do nothing. However good friends we are, however much you like coming to the church and listening to the message from the pulpit, if you don't desire God to open you, I cannot do it. God's got the combination number for your mind to open it. God knows how to open it, to give you an insight that you, you will know things without even studying them. You understand them, not just know about them, but understand them. Hallelujah. And that's very important. So he opened their understanding. And in verse 46, I'm going, to, I'm going to qualify these things. So I want to lay this foundation for the church. So this is a reference point. Maybe in the future, if you're not sure about the word of God, come to this message today and you see how the, the, the mechanism, the principles, how to get your understanding in God. And getting your understanding in God is not about just reading books. It's not just about speaking to friends. It's about having a relationship with him, connecting with him, changes everything. Because what happens vertical it impacts horizontally. Yeah? Watch this. Then he said to them, that is his, thus it is written, and that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Okay? Now, so he begins to explain to them after he opens their understanding. Now they have a capacity to understand. Before he opened their mind, they could not understand. Yeah? And when he opened their understanding, they began to understand about not just about the world around them, but they understand about their frailty, their weaknesses, and their limitations. And that's where they, 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 they come to the understanding that without him, they can do nothing. Because we think we're self-sufficient. Yeah? We think it's all about us. But we're limited. We don't know what the next moment brings. So we have to trust him, who is the author of our faith of life and eternity. And this is, this is where it comes to that relationship is very important. However much we enjoy the relationship with each other, you need to have a moment with God personally with him. And when Jesus was teaching the parables, he said to the disciples when they came into the house, he, told, he made a profound statement to them. He said something to them. This is what he said to them in Matthew chapter 13, verse 11. He says this. He answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Okay? So how is it structured? So when we read the word, we can need to understand how the word is structured, how the, how the verse is structured. It has been given to you. What's the implication of being given to you? Being given means you haven't taken it, you receive it. You, didn't, you can never under grasp it unless it's been given to you, it's been, unless it's been unlocked as he opened their understanding. So he's given them the insight to his purpose, to, to their purpose, his purpose, their purpose must be connected. And he gives them that, that connection, that revelation to understand. 
Yeah? So he gives them that. It's, it's not something you take. You desire. You ask and you receive. Knock and it's open. Seek and you will find. So coming back to the subject today, there is an end to it. You need to understand. You need to be open to the Spirit to get a grasp of what it means when God intervenes in your life. And, and what does, what, how does it being an end look to you? How does it look from your viewpoint that things are over, things have changed, things are changing for the better for you? Because you might be in the same situation and your surroundings might not change around you, but there is an end to something. What is that end to something that you experience? I wish I was speaking. Come, stay with me here. Stay with me here. Because you might be in that situation and there might be an end to your attitude to how you look at that situation, even though that situation is still there. But you have, there's an end to how you've been looking at it and you've been empowered that you can transcend it and you can overcome it, even though it's there. You might be working with someone you're uncomfortable with they're not pleasant they're still going to be in the employment but the end to it is your way you're looking at them is different it doesn't mean you're going to be taken out of the situation it means you're going to be transformed in that situation yeah that's how there's an end to it looks like sometimes yeah so there's things like we, and as we take that journey, we get to understand how God works within our, our contradictions, within our difficulties, and within our challenges. Yeah. Now let me just come back to our verses that we read today, which is very important and powerful. The first verse that we looked at is Jeremiah chapter 29. Okay. And God prophesied to Israel that they were going to captivity, and he gave them a time period of 70 years, prophetic. And true to God's word, because God's word is perfect, they were taken into captivity, into bondage, and taken captive and the king to Babylon. Yeah? Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. They were taken into Babylon. The word Babylon means confusion. And sometimes when running around like headless chickens, self-importance, all about me, myself, and I, and all these things, we bring ourselves sometimes to places of confusion when we don't draw from wise counsel. And God sometimes allows us, permits us to be in that situation for a period of time. But it's not indefinite. It means that there is an end to it. Amen. Today there is an end to how you think, how you see things. Your attitude, there is an end to you. Change, you want to change your life, change your attitude. You want to change your, what, your future, change what you do. Because if you do what you did, you're going to get what you got. You need to start having a different outlook, changing what, how you live your life, what you behave, how, how your, your daily cycle uh, changes in, everyday, on, in an everyday sense. Things can change. So we're told here that God speaks to them about their captivity and says that 70 years, that time of bondage, that time of oppression... And he said to them, while you're there, be good citizens. Support, bless the people in Babylon. Help make a change in Babylon for the better. So wherever we are, we must be the best version of ourselves. Whether we like it or not, be the best version of yourself. And always leave a place better than what you found it. Not worse. If someone's downcast, help them be lifted up. If someone has an issue of some kind, help them, give them, give them encouragement, give them hope. How will they see that hope? Through your, through your eyes, through your life, because you live by example. Now, watch this. So therefore, therefore, 17, God speaks to them in their captivity and says, you know what? There is going to be an end to this. And this 70 years is metaphorically translated to us. What does that 70 years look like for us? What does it mean for us? 70 years is a symbolic number. What have you been going on, going through for a period of time that you feel you need to overcome and move and get out of? God is saying to you today, there is an end to it. I'm liberating you. I'm setting you free. Well, this is the message of Jesus Christ in the Gospel of Luke chapter 4, verse 18. This is what Jesus said. Watch this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery to the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. There is an end to it. There is an end to those who are blind spiritually, those who are impoverished spiritually, because this reflects spirituality. And he says, uh, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Those who are in captivity today is your day that you'll be liberated. The chains will be broken 
broken. The straight jacket will be taken off and you walk out of it with the freedom and the joy of the Lord, which will be your strength. Do you want that? Well, you can, you can leave here the same way you came. If you're looking, you're trying to look for the veil and you're not open, say, Lord, give me an insight. Underst- help me understand what you are saying to me today. Help me understand. Amen. And God will give you that. And I believe we, we are body, soul, and spirit. The problem is the world teaches we're only body, physical, but there is a spiritual aspect to life. How do you account for dreams? How many people had a dream last night? You had a dream? Did anyone have a dream last night? Can, does anyone ever dream? How, how do you account for dreams? They're not real. You don't touch them. You're, you're, it's like another world. It's like some of the dreams are so vi- real, so vivid. You think you're, you're walking in them. And when you wake up, you think your wake up is your sleep and your sleep is your wake up. <laughs> how does it work? We have something more in us. If we're just a chemical, why do, can we rational? Why do we have rationale? Why can we think? Why can't we be creative? We're just a chemical reaction in an evolution process chain of events. How, we so, how do we have emotions? How do we become sad? How do we become happy? How can we love? How do all these things happen? If we're just a chemical reaction, there's more to us makeup than meets the eye. And people cannot always explain it. So they avoid the question. But God is the answer. Praise God. So he says, he says to them, look, he says, look, there is an end to it, but I have a plan for you. And God has a plan for us, I believe, today. Something goodness. In spite of the world conflict, in spite of the confusion, and lots of people are in confusion, let the dust settle so we can see clearly. He says, I've got, there's a, there's a, I've got a plan for you. He says very clearly, for I know the thoughts I I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God wants to continue to give us a future and hope. China, God has given a future and hope. God has sown the seeds of the church in China to bring hope to people. For whatever regimes are taking place there, the, the word of God transcends everything, which is powerful. And then he says this, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. Wow. He says, that if you call on me, I'm going to listen to you. But there's a way to call on him from the heart with sincerity. And you will seek me and find me. And when you search for me with all your heart, and when you search for me with all your heart, I will be found by you, by you says the Lord. And I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from the, all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. So God's going to, restoration. God restores the years the locusts have eaten. Yeah? God is the God of their gain. God anoints in double, double fold. Yeah? You cannot outgive God. It's so amazing. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So what has a beginning has an end. Hallelujah. That's a powerful statement. And nothing lasts forever. And we know the impermanency of, of life. That's transit. It keeps moving forward. And it's a fundamental aspect of life. You cannot avoid it. It happens. You cannot stop the wheel of time turning. We, we develop, we grow, some for the good, some for the bad. Some experiences in life make us embittered. Some makes us, make, make us happy, make us hopeful, change us. So, but there's a world of life that keeps turning around. The important thing, we must accept change and grow graciously, grow old graciously and learn from it and be an example for the people coming after us. To encourage us, to encourage them. Leave a legacy of something good behind. Not something bad, not something destructive, but something constructive that people can build on. Leave a foundation that others can build on after you. Leave the place better than what you found it, praise God. So we're all part of a, we're builders in building blocks of life to make life a better place. Unfortunately, the, the powers that be, world governments, have lost sight. We haven't learned from all the wars and all the conflicts. and we're, we're repeating the same problems. Why? Because if you don't learn from the past, you repeat it. And that's what we need to learn to make ourselves better people. 
And that's the whole purpose of why we do all these projects and all these things, to make good people better people and to make bad people good people and good people better people. That's the mantra that we live by. And, it's, and, it's, and, it, and there's no condition to it. It's unconditional. It doesn't matter where people are. We want to leave people in a better place, position in their lives. They have, people have enough challenges in the world. And we don't want to try to alleviate some of the, the, the hurt and pain that people are going through in their life. That we may not always re- realize it. So we need to have, have, accept change. Life is a process. And when we know that things change, something important happens. Do you know what happens? We appreciate the present. We're either living in the past or living in the future. But when we know change takes place, we need to learn to appreciate the moment because this is fleeting, this is passing. So the person, someone said to me, who's the most important person in your life? And my response was this, the person I'm speaking to or the person who's in my immediate vicinity. Because we're thinking, where are my this somewhere else? So every person you encounter, that person has crossed your history. So that person at that moment is the most important person in your life. Because you don't know if you're going to have an, another encounter with someone else. You've seen, you heard what I shared last week, the testimony. My, two of my friends, one of my dearest friends, Phil, we passed away overnight. We were expecting to meet him. In fact, Christian's here. He was going to come with me on Tuesday to the Navy cadets to see to see him and be a part of it and everything, and it was over. So cherish the moment, celebrate the moment. There's power in the now, and live. live. Don't just exist. Because if your mind is always somewhere else, you're not living, you're just existing. And make the most of the moment. Enjoy, relish the moment. It's like a meal, a, a delicate meal that you've tasted, taste and flavors you've never had before. Savor them and taste them and experience every time. Don't just be fat, fast food junkies and just push it down your throat and not taste the flavors. Be a Michelin chef, not a fast, fast food, quick, turn it out any which way. Just gratify it for the moment. Savor life. Get the moments, experience, and you'll see good in everything. And never take second, third hand information. Learn for yourself. You know? Often as I was growing up in my life, people had opinions of different people around. When I met the people, I said, this is not the person that person was talking about. <laughs> Get to learn for yourself. Savor the moment. Enjoy the moment. And once you learn that, you, you, it teaches you to cope with loss. People pass over. You cope because you understand that's a process of life. We're on a journey, but most importantly, God is in the equation. He changes everything. And so when we know things change, we can learn to motivate ourselves in that moment. Praise God. And bring the best out of ourselves. Bring the best out of yourself uh, that you can. Praise God. So it's important to understand that there is an end to it and, and nothing remains the same. Nothing lasts forever. David knew that he was going through a process, King David. And he was in expectation, anticipating, he was living the best life he could live at the moment. He made mistakes, but he accounted for them, he accepted them, he embraced them, and he took responsibility of his, of his mistakes. And he said, Lord, change me. Huh. So when we know there's something that's not right, uh, we ask God to change us, and we draw from the sources that can help us change for the better and not for the worse, because the people around you will determine how you progress, whether you become an overcomer or you become overtaken. It's up to you who you associate with. Associate with good things, virtuous things, and things will change. David says this in Psalm 17, verse 15. As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I should be satisfied when I wake in your likeness. And, and David wanted to reflect the likeness of his creator of God. And there's no better person to, 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 to look like than God. God wanted you to look like him. <laughs> Yeah, God wanted you to look like him. Unfortunately, we try and make God look like us, but we, he wants us to look like him. Change, change is taking place. Things never remain the same. Everything changes. There is an end to it. Hallelujah, praise God. And um, it's important. You know, when I was in music years ago, uh, when you tune your guitar, we have some guitars here. I won't do the object lesson here, but I'll just explain to you. You may get understanding. If not, I'll explain it later to you. If you have a tuning fork, which is the key, 
the A that you'll tune your guitar to, yeah? And it's, it's a hertz, it's, it resonates at a certain frequency. But if you have two guitars, one tuned on a different frequency, the other tuned on a different frequency, when they try to play, play together, they're out of tune. Who's the classical guitarist here who plays guitar? Do you play guitar? Yeah, classical guitar, yes. Our, our brother here is a classical guitarist. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, okay. And, but, so when you're playing together, there, there's a discourse. The sound is not harmonious. But when you tune the, the, to the same, the objective note, the A, with its, with its vibration frequency, you're playing your in harmony. And there's an objective truth and there's a subjective truth. We define truth in humanity and we decide what's right, what's wrong. That's fine. But does it resonate with God's truth? So with the more closer we get to more God's truth and we all tune our, our instruments to God's frequency, we'll all be in harmony. And this is why the world is in disharmony, discord, because it's not tuning to objective peace, love, joy, servitude, uh, forgiveness, love of God is limited to its own emotions because the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit. You get that when you get home. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave you there for a moment. Job also exclaims and says... I'll wait till my change comes. Hallelujah. This is uh, Job chapter 14, verse 44. He says, uh, if a man dies, should he live again? And all the days of my hard service, I will wait till my change comes. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. You wait till your change comes. But let me give you a little uh, footnote here. When you change, you might not be the flavor of the month. Because people don't like you to change. Yeah? When Israel were 400 years in slavery and bondage in Egypt, and God sent them a redeemer. The reason he sent them the redeemer, because he heard their groans. They cried to God, get us out of here. And you see, he said, if you, if you seek me, you will find me. So they started to pray from an urgency from the heart. And God heard their prayer. And he sent the Redeemer in the person of Moses to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go after 400 years of bondage and oppression. To take them out of the iron furnace of Egypt, the taskmaster, the slaves that had the whips on their backs on a daily basis. And God sent them a redeemer because they said, enough is enough. It's got to be the end. It has to finish. There has to be an end to this. And metaphorically, we might be going through those struggles that Egypt had in a spiritual sense in our lives today. We might feel oppressed. We might feel uh, emotionally challenged in different ways. And we, we've got to say, we want it over. It's got to be over. And God will intervene and help you get you out of that situation. And he brought Pharaoh to the place after the template to allow the children of Israel to leave. After 400 years, there was an end to it. I wish I had more time. Time is fleeting just to unpack all this. And when he allowed them to leave after the firstborn was slain and the angel of death passed Egypt and it passed over the houses of the blood on the lentil, on the doorposts, the covenant. God is a, co a covenant keeper. Uh, he, the, Pharaoh decided enough is now, let them go. But then when he let them go, realized his workforce had all left. He had remorse. And he got 6,000 chariots to come after them. Amen. Praise God. And so he said, I've got, I've got to bring them back. The, the enemy, your emotions, the past doesn't let you go easily. It wants to bring you back into captivity. I'm telling you, it wants to bring you back into captivity. So sometimes it's not easy to get away from past. And we've got to make that effort and say, God, help me through whatever I'm going through. Help me come through this. Hallelujah. And God is more than willing to help us in that process. Hallelujah. Because your captivity is not dependent on Pharaoh. It's not dependent on, on even God. It's dependent on your attitude and your desire. That's the key. That's the power that helps you move on and overcome in his love. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we see they left Egypt, it says, with boldness. I, if I had time, I'll go through all the verses and just unpack them. But because of time, I just want to just give you a little overview and then come back to the conclusion of the message. And so they left, fled Egypt. They left Egypt and God opened the sea. And with all the impossibilities, God made a way where there's no way. 
and just give it over to him. Say, Lord, today I'm standing at a threshold on the horizon of new things. I want to step out of here, out of this, whatever I'm going through. And if you're not going through, help someone else get out of what they're going through. And help encourage someone today. Be an encourager. Be a source of help. And you see what the difference it will make in, in, in your life as well as in their life. And there's many examples in the Bible of people for a long time suffering in their ailments, in their emotions, and God steps in and changes everything. I want to finish on these last two. One of them is a man who's for 38 years, he was paralyzed. And in the Gospel of John chapter 5, it says it was by the pool and every, every so often an angel will come down, stir the water, and whoever got there first, they, they would be healed. But he was complaining to Jesus that he has no man to put him into the water. And the other person I want to look and compare with is the woman who was bowed for 18 years. She was bent over for 18 years. She couldn't look up. She was oppressed. And today I would like to say to you, whatever that 38 years represents to you, whatever that 18 years represents, today's the time you can rise up and move out in a new way. But it has to be con con consensual. It's not forced on you. You stand up and say, Lord, help me through whatever I'm going through. Make me, transform me, empower me, equip me, and I'm and to continue with my journey. Because today is a new day. As Paul says, anyone in Christ is a new creation. Everything old has passed away, and everything has become new. There is newness in, in the love and relationship with God. Who was that newness today? I pray for you today that as you leave here, you have a new outlook. Whatever distractions you had, whatever concerns you have, God is helping you resolve them, deal with them, and overcome them. And connect to the people that can reinforce and help you overcome those challenges. Not people who continually relish you being in those problems, but people who truly want you to get out of those situations and circumstances. I pray that God will speak to you in a very profound way today as we, as we continue to move on, look into his love to help us overcome. There is an end to it, praise God. In fact, I've asked Pastor Dominic, there's a, a chorus I want him to sing. Where is he? Is he here? Have you got it ready? Yeah, he's going to sing us a little chorus just to highlight what I've been saying. There is an end to it. I want you to listen to a few of these words. Please embrace that and listen. Uh, and I know some people's chains have broken even as I'm speaking. Your mindset has changed. The way you're processing life is beginning to change. Hallelujah. Nothing lasts forever. As you get ready there. As I says, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Sure you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Praise God. Listen to this chorus. I thought it's a very appropriate.